<laughs> Do you guys realize this is our last real lecture? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Well, this is the last one where we get the, you know, new content. I mean, we're still kind of reviewing it. We're tailing off, but uh, we end chapter 25. Um, next lecture, we'll review. And you have an exam Friday. And then there's only two more lectures after that. I'm not going to expose you to new stuff that I'll test you on. We'll just review and have fun the last two days, all the whole semester. I, I got a couple demos uh, I got planned that you haven't seen yet. That we covered, but I didn't, you didn't get to see them. And the final is uh, May 2nd. May 2nd, here at 10.30, class time. It's on my syllabus and it's on, I didn't decide it, the university picked that. Is it, it's going to be comprehensive over everything. What would you ask? Is it going to be brutal? Um, I mean, you can take this for what it's worth. It'll, you, you get 10.30 to 12.30 is the slotted time. So I intend to ask you, it'll be a little longer than a normal one. But I don't intend to double it on purpose. I haven't, I haven't finished the final yet. I finished exam four. Uh, same format. And the part that if means anything to you, when I was going through questions and making them up or looking at other, a database, I would take some for the homework. I would take some for your test. And I'd go, oh, and that one seems good for the final. <laughs> so I decided then. And in my mind, I know, the one on the final I thought was easier than the ones I were putting on the homework. They were more general, because I figured by the end of the semester you'd forget the details. <laughs> uh, some of you will probably beg to differ when we get there, but. <laughs> On that note, your uh, homework eight over those, these last two chapters, chapter 24 and 25, is due tomorrow at midnight. So your last homework is due tomorrow. Yeah. I dropped the lowest homework and the lowest test. And yes, I'm still working on your papers. But, but it's fun. And friendly reminder again, uh, the university to your offic official U email has started an evalu course evaluation. Uh, I would love for you to fill these out, especially the written part. Uh, I won't see this until after I submit grades, so it's completely anonymous. Way I can do better or not. <laughs> okay, I want to start with clickers. I think I th picked three questions to ask you. And we'll see what you remember from last time. <laughs> hey, no brace. Or is it under your pant leg? <laughs> so I exposed you to this concept last lecture. It's, in, it's what chapter 25 is all about. Let's see who remembers what. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Forty-seven percent A, a third of you B. So we either think it's when the voltage changes, I mean when a magnetic field changes, or when it aligns with the electric field. This one I'm going to re-ask then as you talk to your neighbor. Let's see who can convince whom. Because it's, it's, you know, less than half of you think one, A, 
And a third of you think B. I'll reopen the polling. There were these two concepts last lecture. A change in something did something, but also uh, something else just deflected something else. So let's see if uh, who's swaying whom. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, a lot less of you. One, you don't want to vote again? Okay, you gotta look. Ooh, 80% A. Kudos to those that convinced people. Yeah, this, this phenomenon is called electromagnetic induction. If you have a change in a magnetic field, you induce a voltage. The uh, second one, you might be thinking, there was an alignment thing, and you know, I did some coils, and I did that so the change was more effective. The perpendicular thing aligning was a magnetic field can exert a force on a moving charge, like an electron beam. And that is most effective when it's perpendicular. If the ma magnetic field's going this way, and the electron's going that way, it'll feel the greatest force. If they're aligned, it won't feel any force. But that's a static magnetic field on a moving charge. This was asking about a changing or moving magnetic field inducing a voltage. All right, this one. I moved a bar magnet in, in and out of a coil a lot. What, what happens? That would be a changing magnetic field, correct? So it should induce a voltage. But what else? This is at, taking it a little further. What else? Lest there's any confusion, picture me sitting here going like this with a magnet in and out of the coil. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bang. Two thirds of you think it's B. You are correct. If you remember me using a DC power supply when I turned it on, that created a change in the coil that was connected to it. That change in magnetic field then, remember current makes a magnetic field? The secondary coil felt that change and induced the current. But then it stopped because the change was over. And then we turned it off, another change. So same with the permanent magnet. If I moved it in, it felt a change. Current flows in one direction. But then it doesn't flow anymore until I pulled it back out. But then the, the needle deflected the other way. So in and out is keeping up a change, but it changes which direction the current flows to. So it would be alternating current. Does that make sense? And this one I didn't t discuss directly. I want to see what you think. When I move that magnet in, into that coil, <coughs> we have an induced voltage, which creates charges flowing. We got a current an induced current. That current now produces a magnetic field that does what? So we're inducing a current in that coil, but because current's flowing in the coil, it becomes an electromagnet. It has its own magnetic field. It's like it's its own little bar magnet, if you will. What's that, what's it do?
clue that can help you. The very last demonstration I did with a magnet falling down the copper pipe. That might help you, some of you. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Beep. Fifty-six percent think it's A. Correct. Correct. You can think of as well, let's go back to the copper pipe. And I'm done with this. As the magnet fell past the copper pipe, the copper, as a conductor, felt a change in magnetic field go by it. So it induced a voltage, which caused current to flow in the copper pipe. That current flowing now creates its own magnetic field. And if you remember, it repelled the falling magnet to slow it down. So it took a long time to go through the copper pipe. Same thing was happening, which I didn't mention, in the coil connected to the meter. When I move the magnet in, the current gets set up in a certain direction to make a magnetic field to oppose that motion. You can think of inertia again. It wants to resist the change. So if I, I bring the magnet in, it sets up a magnetic field in the, from the coil to oppose that motion. When I pull the magnet out, it feels a decrease and it sets up the current in the other direction, which flips the magnetic field, trying to attract the magnet back, saying, no, no, I like it now. So it, it resists the change, but it always repels the, the, uh, the magnet that caused the change. This pendulum, this is a piece of plastic, and I'm going to swing it through this, this horseshoe magnet. The magnetic field's going that way, and This is our control situation. It's supposed to be not exciting. This is just to show you what happens when something swings. <laughs> I'm going to change it to a conductor. It's aluminum. It's not magnetic. It doesn't stick, but it's, it's conductive. Will it swing the same, faster, slower? What do you think? Well, we've got a slower and a faster. What do you think will happen to the charges in this conductor when they swing through the magnetic field? Oh, steer, right? It's a narrow window. There we go. It slows down. As it swings through the magnetic field, these charges feel a change in magnetic field. Increase as it goes in and then a decrease as it leaves. In both cases, as it's coming in, it feels an increase, a change in magnetic field, charges start flowing. Those charges are now flowing. We have a little current. They create their own magnetic field, and that magnetic field resists or opposes this magnetic field as it comes in. As it leaves, it fills it in the other direction. The current switches direction. So does the magnetic field due to this. And it says, no, no, it's trying to attract it back. So it, it switches, it's alternating, but the effect is magnetic dampening. And this is very useful. I love it in top, in, in balances. You know, you put, you're trying to put your weight on there and you move the thing. That thing could sit there and oscillate forever. But most of them have a little aluminum thing in between a little magnet. So as it's oscillating, it damps it out. Some uh, amusement park rides will use this. I know one popular one, one of the uh, backup systems is the one where you're, you're sitting there and they just drop you. And you go, whee! And you use, if you're in a little uh, box, but then the box will swing on its back and slow you down. Well, if you had a big fin like this on the back side, and as you went down, it went through some strong magnets, whether they were permanent or electromagnet, that could help slow you down as they tried to swing or s slide through. It's one way that could work. Also, I mentioned levitating trains. Remember the superconductor, how you could levitate the magnet? There's other ways to do that, but with magnetic fields, if they're not rubbing, there's no friction. They're a lot more efficient. You can go faster. Well, how do you stop one then? You can't just go use friction to slow you down like everything else. You use magnetic fields to slow them down. 
You can either change the direction with an electromagnet or use something like this. Now, what do you think this one will do? It's aluminum. It's conductor, so will charges start to move? What's that? Oh, but there's a break. So maybe they're going to be pushed and tried to move, but they don't make a complete loop. And let's see what happens. Yeah, a lot less effective because, yeah, it's a break in the circuit. It's conductor, so it's trying to move the charges, but they can't because it's not a closed circuit. This one, very similar, but we didn't go cut it all the way to the ends. Now maybe it could make little loops. Let's see. Yeah, that one dampens out. Not as fast as this one, because there's not as much material, but it still dampens. Another fun one, one of my all-time favorites, we call the ring shooter. I have a, a switch down here. When I connect it, electricity flows through the coil of wire, creating a magnetic field. This is a bunch of iron. What's it do to it? Magnetizes it. And does that increase or de take away from the total field? It increases because now we have the magnetic field from this guy and this guy. Here's a piece of aluminum. What's that magnetic field going to do to the aluminum? Say again? Before that? I heard it over here. Yeah, there's the steps. Good job. It's going to push the charges around in here. Because this magnetic field's always changing. I didn't tell you that. It's, it's plugged in, but it's AC. It's alternating current. So this magnetic field's always flipping. Makes charges move around. They create their own magnetic field, and it repels this guy's magnetic field. So yeah, it feels a force. And it's not because this is magnetic. It's, it, it, uh, the little currents that get induced in it create a magnetic field, that, which then repels. There's a lot more to this, but that's the, that's the gist. This one has a slit. Do you see that opening? What do you think? Boring. Yeah, current can't flow, so the charges aren't moving, so there's no magnetic field of its own, or this guy's magnetic field has no moving charges to push on. Remember, magnetic fields don't exert forces, can't deflect non-moving charges. They deflect moving charges. Uh, moving charges. Um, if, more liquid nitrogen, if I cool this guy down, what should happen to his resistance? Who says increase? Who says decrease? Okay, I heard Bo, I'm just checking. You're right, it decreases. So we'll do the exact same thing. Do you expect for the same induced voltage from changing magnetic field, more or less current will flow? More. More charges moving around to feel a kick. Ready for this one? <laughs> Ooh, ah! <laughs> okay, catch. <laughs> there we go. And as it warms up, its resistance increases. Less current will get induced into it, and it won't go quite as high. It's ow, still <laughs> higher than before. Oh, yeah, over here. <laughs> it's just cold. It's safe to touch now, though. <laughs> Why do I get zapped? Oh, it's in, this, why did I not get zapped when I touched this? It's insulated. Yeah, there's a coating on this. Yeah. 
Good point. <laughs> there, watch this. Here's a steel rod. What do we think will happen when I hit the power now? We've got le one vote for levitation. Well, let's think it through. We'll send current through here. It'll create a magnetic field. What will happen to steel, which contains iron? It's going to get magnetized. Yeah, it magnetizes it and then gets sucked in. That's essentially what we were doing to this. This was iron. I just put in here, but I clamped it down. And so, like we noted earlier, this gets magnetized, becomes a strong magnet itself, and that's why when we put this ring on here, it can feel that force the whole time. It's around this guy's magnetic field. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah, that's a good question. Why doesn't this get magnetized? Anybody want to attempt an answer? This goes back to those magnetic domains, the little microscopic compass needles inside. And for iron, exposed to an, an external magnetic field, then there's a net alignment. And so it becomes a magnet. It's not sufficient in aluminum to become a magnet. But the free charges that are free to move can create an electro, a little, uh, they're called eddy currents, and those create a magnetic field which repels this guy's magnetic field. Like aluminum? Copper? Yeah. Um, I don't get much silver to play with, but I think silver, but aluminum and copper are the two most common. Yeah. Brass? A little bit. Not as effective. Iron would get magnetized and then just stick, be attracted, because it got magnetized. Uh, here is a bell I found. I almost forgot about it. And when you turn on the power and ramp it up, school's out. The current's going through the coils. But why I really like this, this is DC current. That's okay. DC current still move, makes charges move. Moving charges create magnetic fields. You see the core inside, it gets magnetized. And what's it do when it becomes a strong electromagnet? It attracts this bar that's free to move. It's attracted to these, like that. This gets pulled over. When it gets pulled over, it breaks a connection right here. I'll do it again and maybe you'll see some sparks. When that gets pulled over, it breaks the connection. Current no longer flows. The field collapses, they're no longer magnetic, and this springs back. Makes the connection, current flows, magnetized, pulled over, breaks the connection, and that's what makes a simple bell work. Some of you have probably heard the terms solenoid. Maybe. Anybody? <laughs> um, they have this effect. You can pull the core. It, makes it, it sucks it in or out. You can, you can move the core as you magnetize something. Very similar to this guy as he got pulled in. And so you can use that to unlock something or, you know, as a switch. Door locks. Car door locks. There's a solenoid in your car. It's a coil of wire, and when you send electricity through it, it makes a magnet. And that magnetizes a core, which can get pushed in or pulled out and, and make a connection to drive things in your car. I don't feel like getting into at the moment. But <laughs> and, okay, it worked like 12 times since last lecture, so here we go. We'll try this one again. 
Flip the switch, send current through this, this, these uh, coils. Not a magnet at the moment. Current flowing. It's enough to hold all that up. As long as current's flowing and there's a magnetic field and it gets magnetized. Break the circuit. Current stops flowing. They're no longer magnetic. Whammo. Okay, we talked about uh, putting, uh, where's the, there it is, the magnetic tape, how you can record bits of information on your tape. You might have one section that's, the net alignment's up, and then maybe down, and then down, down, oh, and then up, ones and zeros. How do you, how do you read a tape then? Okay, we can magnetize it to store info. How do we read that information off of it? Well, here's some magnetic material, correct? And what does this tape do when it's in, physically? Yeah, it slides. Well, wait, we got some magnetic piece here that's moving. So what do we put it near, you think? Yeah, a conductor, a coil of wire. So as a moving bit of magnetic material goes past a conductor, what's it do to the conductor? This is the electromagnetic induction. A changing magnetic field induces a voltage in that coil. And we know a voltage then pushes the charges around and makes a current. That's electromagnetic induction. And then we can use that current as a signal. Oh, and if the current goes one way, we know this was magnetized, say, up. And if the current flows the other way, oh, we know it's down. And the rate that it switches tells us how long, you know, because we know how fast this is going. That's how we read magnetic material and get the info off through this electromagnetic induction. I got clever. I got a paper clip. There we go. All right. Let's see more induction. Uh, I don't want to go there yet. This one. How many have seen these shaker flashlights that use no batteries? Oh, less of you than I thought. I call this a Faraday flashlight. Uh, Faraday's law, we're going to get to. But here's a, ba a uh, battery. Uh, magnet. <laughs> right here, the silver thing that's bouncing in the bottom. And here's a coil of wire. That's really all there is right here. So if I move the, the magnet in and out of the coil, you get light because the coil is connected to the light bulb. And as long as it's feeling a change in magnetic field, there's a voltage induced in the coil pushing the currents around. And they are connected in series with the light bulb, so it pushes them through the light bulb. And my mechanical energy is converted to electrical energy, which is then converted to light. If I stop, no more light. So you're like, oh, how is this useful? There's a capacitor in here. I can flip a switch. And now, where's my mechanical energy going? Yeah, it's being, and what does a capacitor store? Charge. It stores charge. It's, it separates them and stores, short, right? Stores them on the two sides. What else does it store? I'll give you, yeah, because voltage is? It's electric potential, another name for it, which is? energy per charge. So it separates those charges and there's now energy stored. So a capacitor stores charge and energy, and energy in the electric field. So in theory, I've stored some up in there. Now I flip the switch and it connects the capacitor to the, the light bulb. Oh, there we go. Ah. Until it drains and you just do it again. This is, we're generating electricity. This is a generator. Another one. Can you see the light? But it quickly fades. What do you think is moving internally inside here? Charges, magnet. I don't know. 
but something has to be moving. And it's either a magnet moving with respect to a coil or the coil moving with respect to the magnet, or both. This is the one I, I like to give my daughter when she was a kid, and we'd go camping. You see the little black disc? I don't know if you can see it. And then, then there's two coils on the outside. When I do the crank, it spins the gray disc, which is a magnet, near the coils, and you get light. This one doesn't store it, so she can never ruin the battery or, or for anything. I didn't have to worry about her leaving it on all night. And when she'd go hiking around the campsite, I always knew where she was at. My rechargeable uh, drill died. You know, I may have has the battery gone dead on you guys. That bothers me. Well, I can see the little connections in there. So instead of running it as a motor, a motor, this is important, uses electrical energy from the battery and converts it to motion. And you run your drill. Electrical energy to motion. A generator is just the reverse. That's what we've been doing. I'm going to make do the motion, put mechanical energy in, and get what out? Electrical energy. So as I turn, can you see the light bulb? And if I put more energy in, I induce a larger voltage in the coil in there that the light bulb's connected to. So a generator and a motor are essentially the same thing, just run in reverse. That's what this is. This, if I connect this way, see the magnets, the red and blue things? And this coil of wire, I'm going to rotate it. And then through this commutator switches, it goes over through here and a little light bulb. So if I crank, you see what's happening? I stop. I crank. We're moving charges. And if I go more, I get more. Enough to light the light bulb. So I'm generating electricity. So most people, they figure out some other way to do this other than having a grunt stand here like this. So you can have a waterfall go by and make it move, or you can burn coal and then make the steam turn a fan, which is connected to a coil of wire that rotates near a magnet. Nuclear energy, you get the energy some other way, but ultimately it heats up some water, which creates steam, which drives a turbine, which is connected to a coil of wire that moves near a magnet. And you get electricity. Now, this is DC. It's going in one direction. It's constant. If I turn the other way, it goes the other way. If I flip the switch so that it changes the connections here to a different commutator, I can create alternating current. Can you see it wiggle a little? Every time I, because when the coil goes through one way, the current's induced in one direction. But as soon as I flip it to the other side, it wants to flip the other way. So it's alternating current. So you don't see it on here, but if I provide enough, you can still light the light bulb as current is now going back and forth. The filament doesn't care which direction it's going as long as it's got enough going through it. So is that a generator or a motor? I'm converting what type of energy? Into mechanical, into electrical. Generators and motors do not produce energy. They convert it. They're not a miracle machine. Remember thermodynamics? Energy is conserved. They don't produce energy. We like to say they do, but you had to put energy in to get electrical energy out. Motors are the reverse. And I'm, I can, if this works, I can drive it as a motor. I'm going to connect it to electrical energy, this power supply. And I'm going to send a lot of current through this coil. Makes a magnetic field, interacts with this guy's magnet. Hopefully it'll turn it. Um, 12 volts, looks good. 
There we go. And if I up the current a little, it goes faster. This is a motor. I don't know how old this thing is, but it still works pretty darn good. I like it. Questions about generators or motors? They convert it. Mechanical to electrical or electrical to mechanical? Yeah, if you're, uh, yeah. What creates the mechanical? Do you own an RV? Uh -huh. What do you have to turn on if you want power? The battery. No, wait, what, what, is what if, your, if your battery goes dead, do you have a way on your RV to get power back? Uh, so if your battery goes dead, you're hosed? I'm just curious. It's seeing if you already know, I'll make the connection. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the gen. Let's let's. Yeah, your RV. Yeah, if if you you want power and you can't plug into an outlet, where are you getting power? Yeah, the most convenient is your RV's batteries. Where the batteries get their energy. Yeah, chemicals, Some, and somebody had to do work to store that energy in there with the chemicals to release it. Let's say you want to recharge your battery, which works on a car. In your car, when you're running your car, there's something called an alternator. And it's a coil of wire that rotates, because when the engine's turning, it makes it turn. And it's, it's generating electricity, which recharges your battery. That's why if your battery goes dead and you need a jump, you can use somebody else's battery to get you started, but if you immediately turn off your car, your battery hasn't had time to charge back up. Your alternator hasn't had time to do its to transfer work. Thus, you're, you're, you, you need another jump. So you've got to let it run a bit to charge your battery up so that it, your battery can start you the next time. A gen, a generators, those self-standing ones, often run off of gas power. And what do they do? They ignite the gas vapors. And the work done in expanding gas, remember our thermodynamics, then drives something, but ultimately it's going to make a coil move near a magnet to create electricity so that you can use the electrical energy. Good questions. Uh, your chapter talks about Faraday's law, and I mentioned Faraday. I didn't get any chalk yet. Basically, he, Michael Faraday, one of my idols, because he loved to do demonstrations. He was great. But uh, I'm not going to make you solve problems, but he kind of quantified it. And this is a footnote in your chapter, if you want to look at it. But the gist is electromagnetic induction. A changing magnetic field induces a voltage. So. He put together a formula, and I'm just saying the induced voltage is proportional to certain things that he figured out. One, the number of loops. I'm moving a magnet in and out of a coil. Every loop gets charges moving in it. So if you have more loops, you got more charges moving. And so uh, more loops will create a bigger induced voltage. Does that make sense? Uh, the area of the loops can affect. Essentially, you can picture, if this is my bar magnet, the magnetic field lines that go, come out and around it. Those field lines need to go through the coil. They need to pass through the coil for it to feel a change. And the more that it can get capture that go through it, the better. So you can get closer, or you can make it bigger. So the size of the coil affects the voltage induced as well. And the one you should already know, 
a change in, and we haven't used this term before, but B usually represents a magnetic field. So a change in magnetic field. This tells me that if I have a stronger magnet that I'm moving in and out, I'm going to get more voltage. But also, if I move it in and out faster, I'm going to get more voltage because that's a bigger change. So you can uh, uh, change the, mag the magnetic field, how fast it changes, the area you're going through, or the number of coils. All those can affect the voltage that gets induced. That's what Faraday came up with. We've been playing around with that already. But if you make an electromagnet and you want it to be stronger, add more coils is the easiest thing to do because you'll have more loops and they'll add up. Say again? T for times. Thanks. That's just the rate at which you're changing the magnetic field. There's examples of electromagnetic induction all around your life. You, you guys use it without realizing it. A few you might not have been aware of that I, I think you might think interesting. Traffic lights. You're sitting there going, why won't this change? Come on, nobody else is here. Well, maybe that one doesn't have one of those things in the asphalt. If you ever notice, there might be this big circle that seems to be cut in the asphalt or the square thing right about where you're supposed to park. It'll stop. Well, that's a coil of wire with electricity going through it, so it has a magnetic field. And what are you going to do? You're going to drive up with, in a big hunk of iron over that coil, and you're going to affect the magnetic field. And that changes the current that's flowing in the coil, and it can detect that you're there and say, oh, hey, car, maybe we should switch the lights. <laughs> Another one is uh, airport security. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, the drive-up window in fast food. They would know how they know how you. That's how they could know you're there. Yeah, I never thought of that or noticed that before. I'm going to pay attention now. <laughs> uh, airport security. If you walk through any you know, of those things, it's a big coils creating a magnetic field. And if you walk through it with a big knife, same thing. You're going to affect that circuit, and it can sense it. And they're going to go, hey, what do you got? Patch it down. Your card, your, that's a magnetic strip. Is that a what? This is my uh, university purchasing card. <laughs> I'm just not allowed to I let them charge tax. And I can keep it. Right, Catherine? <laughs> um, this is like the tape. You got information stored here, stored in magnetic bits. Why do you have to slide it? Otherwise, it doesn't sense a change in magnetic field, and it can't read it. If you just hold it in there, it's not going to do anything. You need a change of magnetic field, yeah. No, <laughs> but I'm gonna, gonna find out. So yeah, if it doesn't work, you can put it, cover it with paper or something. Yeah, cover it. I don't know. Anybody know already? I've got to research that. Cool. I know sometimes you can change the speed you go. And, you know, these get messed up you're in your wallet. They get sweaty. They rub against other cards. get scratched. And so it might be hard to read, just like a CD in that sense, if they get scratched. And sometimes you go faster. You can induce a greater voltage. Go faster. Get a bigger voltage. Maybe it can read that signal. But the paper, I'm going to have to think about that one. If anybody else finds it out before me, let me know. Um, yeah, there's some examples. Okay, last thing is transformers. 
I want to do today. They are, if you remember, we did the big one. In this sense, it's connected to the power, so this is going to be the primary coil. This is going to be the secondary coil. They're not electrically connected. But I hope you see now that this guy's changing magnetic field is going to induce a voltage in this coil, which will cause a current to flow. And it's connected to the light bulb, so when I flip the switch, you can induce a voltage in here without being electrically connected. You can see it exerts a force on it too, like the aluminum ring. But this is heavier. That's a transformer, primary, secondary. You can do it with that little light bulb here connected to a coil of wire. But it's fun because I put it in a beaker of water. It still works. You guys probably can't see that. You see the light? This magnetic field, changing magnetic field, can go through glass, water, and into that coil and cause the charges in the secondary to flow. It doesn't have to be connected. They, they generally aren't. Actually, you don't want it to be. Here's another one. A friend of mine, was we, we were bored one day. So this is a transformer out of an old microwave oven. You see that this is the primary that's plugged into the wall. We took out the secondary and put in this big fat wire. And there's only two turns. Because transformers, you can step up the voltage or step down the voltage. Step up the current or step down the current. This one, I'm going from lots of turns to very few turns. So it's going to take the 120 volts out of the wall and step it down. 120 volts on the primary, a whole lot less on the secondary. And the ratio of turns is the same ratio that the voltage gets stepped up or down. If you're going to less turns, then the voltage will drop by the same ratio. Do you remember what power is? Ooh, good. The rate we use energy. Yeah, energy per time. Which in electricity, I worked it out, comes to be the current times the voltage. That is still the same thing. Energy is conserved. So, so is power. Transformers do not step up power. They step up or step down voltage. So in this one, I'm going to step down the voltage. Do you see that? What will happen to the current? If that goes down, current's going to go up. So it's like this. I'm going to have current on the primary, I mean power on the primary circuit. And I'm going to get power out on the secondary circuit. So if I have a lot of voltage and little current, I'm stepping down the voltage, that drops, so the current is going to increase to keep the power the same, because energy is conserved. So if I get a whole lot of current out of this, watch what happens. Connect the switch. I can spot weld with this. I've done it. <laughs> A whole lot of currents flowing, you can tell from the sparks. Because I've stepped down the voltage, thus the current went up. So transformers step up or down voltage. The current then adjusts appropriately because the power stays the same. And the last one are these. I have this light bulb plugged in first. And then this transformer, you tell me what happens. The primary coil has 440 turns. The secondary has 220, half as many turns. What's going to happen to the voltage? We're going to go from 440 to 220, cut in half. So will the voltage step up or down? Down. down and by the same factor, a factor of half. And you can see it's dimmer. 
If the voltage went down, what happened to the current here? Yeah. How does the power compare here to here? How about here to here? What do you think is happening in this one? The opposite. I have the 220 connected here and the 440 there. So it's stepping the voltage up here. So we step the voltage down, current went up. Step the voltage back up, current goes down. That's a transformer. It only works with AC current. Any last minute questions? I'll be done.